there are no shortage of war films that put the innocence of childhood up against the terror of armed conflict. But perhaps none is better than Steven Spielberg's Empire of the Sun, which stars a young Christian Bale who is selected out of 4,000 auditions, a testament to his staggering talent which we've seen innumerable times since Empire of the Sun was released in 1987. This story covers a wide range of fascinating themes, but the one I want to discuss today is the ideal, examples set by others that we wish to replicate. Jamie has many different ideals throughout his journey, which ends with the atomic bombing, and the way he interacts with them is fascinating and can teach us something about the identity transition from childhood to adulthood. Like most other young boys, Jamie's first ideal is his father. His father works at a British settlement in Shanghai, and he's been able to give his wife and son an extremely privileged life. We don't get to spend too much time with Jamie's father, but it's clear that he's dedicated to his job, perhaps even too dedicated, and he also cares about his family. The only problem is, Jamie's father is best suited for peacetimes. He is unable to read the temperature of the room when the Japanese are closing in, which ultimately leads to the separation of his family. The party that he takes his family to is the best example of his uncomfortable relationship with the coming conflict. He's a sociable man who's intelligent and pleasant to talk with, but he doesn't display the traditional warrior attributes which are valued in times of war, and Jamie finds his father's missing traits in the Japanese pilot. What's unique about Jamie and Empire of the Sun in general is its agnostic stance on the war itself. Jamie is British, but he's never been to the British mainland. He lives in China, but he doesn't have any close relationships with the people. The only Chinese people he's around frequently are his house workers, who he treats rather poorly. Jamie doesn't have a dog in the fight, no pun intended. He loves aviation, so he roots for the pilots he perceives to be the bravest and most competent. At the beginning of the story, the Japanese are his selection, but that changes as the war goes on. And on a side note, I love this shot of Jamie's mom lighting a cigarette as Jamie holds up his plane. It beautifully replicates the nighttime raids during World War II. Once Jamie is separated from his family, a common Spielberg trope, he quickly comes to the realization that the boy he's become by mimicking his father is not going to help him survive. He returns home and tries to resume life, but everything has changed. The past has been wiped away, and the shield around him provided by his father's status can no longer protect him. It's at this point that Jamie's second and most important ideal enters the picture in the form of Basie. His introduction spells out what the nature of the relationship will be. Basie's face, his identity, is hidden, and focus is instead put on the food he is cooking, the commodity he can offer, the path to survival. Basie treats Jamie okay at first as he searches him for value, and then he gives him a new name for a new life, Jim. This new name is what others will call the pragmatic Jamie, the Jamie who will divorce himself from the values taught by his father and accept the values instilled by Basie. Now Basie is unable to sell his new friend Jim and is about to abandon him, but Jim talks him into exploring the luxurious neighborhood he used to live in. The adventure fails horribly and lands both of them in a prison camp. It's in this first prison camp that Jim learns what it takes to survive from Basie. He learns about only drinking boiled water and bowing to the guards, but there are some more brutal lessons that Jim's past identity struggles to swallow. Basie commands Jim to take the potato from a lady who died, and he also tries to strip the shoes off of her. And the looting is introduced by showing the shadow of Basie. What he's doing may be necessary for survival, but there is a cost to it. The soul is darkened. The identity of others, and yourself, is washed away by necessity and desperation. You're just an animal fighting to live another day. When Jim and Basie arrive at the permanent internment camp, the first thing Jim does is run to the Japanese planes. Even after all he's endured, his romantic feelings about aviation have been preserved. It's a stunning scene with the sparks dancing behind him, and it's really the last gasp of Jim's childhood wonder that will soon be sent to the gallows by Basie's pragmatism. And his salute to the Japanese pilots is another reminder of how much he values bravery during this time. When the story picks up a couple of years later, another ideal has entered the picture who tries to counterbalance the influence of Basie, and this would be Dr. Rawlings. Now, Dr. Rawlings acknowledges the benefits of knowing Basie. He's a survivor and his tips are important, but Dr. Rawlings doesn't want Jim to forget the other side of life. He tries to continue Jim's education, and in one of my favorite moments, 
He asked Jim to recite a poem. Today we will die tomorrow, time stoops to no man's lure. With love going faint and fretful, no, no, lips no, no, but half no, no. full weeps. Try to learn it as a poem. It's too much not just a string of words, you know. By this point, Jim has lost interest in things that don't have any intrinsic value. If something cannot help him survive, then who cares? This is why he's unable to read the poem with the delicacy and soul that it deserves. Another counterbalance to Basie is Mr. and Mrs. Victor. Jim wants to room next to Basie in the American barracks, but he's stuck rooming next to the Victors. The Victors are reluctant parental figures for Jim. He annoys them, but they recognize that he's just a kid who's being broken down by his environment. Basie and the Americans are less concerned with what's happening to their little soldier. They see him as an asset that pays dividends. Nothing more, nothing less. When Jim tells Basie that he should take him out of the camp because they're friends, the look on Basie's face says it all. There are no friends here. All relationships are transactional. Jim is able to win access to the American barracks by crawling outside of the prison fence and setting up traps. And as he's venturing out there, the Americans are petting on whether he'll be blown up by a mine or get caught. So these men aren't exactly overly concerned with his well-being, obviously. When Jim makes it out alive, he's covered in dirt, symbolizing the transformation his soul is going through. The battle between Basie's way of life and the way of life taught by Jim's British ideals is waged until the very end, and we get to see the benefits of each. Dr. Rawlings is saved by what Jim has learned from Basie, but when Basie is put in the hospital later in the film, he and Jim interact with a literal and metaphorical barrier between them. Their pragmatic way of life keeps their bodies alive, but it inhibits their ability to connect with others and transcend the cold-hearted nature of war. Now maybe my favorite moment in the film occurs at the peak of this battle. American P-51s attack the Japanese airstrip, and Jim celebrates the skill of the American pilots and the power of their planes. It's a bizarre sight, a child celebrating as destruction ensues around him. But when Dr. Rawlings comes to protect him, we see that Jim is only celebrating to mask the pain of what's happened to him. He tells Dr. Rawlings, and it's incredible acting from Christian Bale, that I can't remember what my parents look like. It's a devastating statement, and Dr. Rawlings doesn't know what to say. I mean, there really isn't anything to say. So it just gives Jim a hug. And after the scene concludes, Jim returns to his old bed next to Mr. and Mrs. Victor, clearly desperate to be reminded of his former life. And Mrs. Victor understands the motivation behind his return and helps him unpack. The final half hour of the film is extremely unique. Basie escapes the camp without Jim, cementing his transient father figure status, and everyone else is forced to evacuate. The march through the country is very Apocalypse Now-esque. It feels like a dream, especially when they enter a stadium full of abandoned luxury furniture. It's Jim's former reality and current reality meeting in some sort of limbo. It's at this stadium that two major events happen that I think condense the film's message. The first event is the death of Mrs. Victor, the last person treating Jim like the boy he was. And right as she dies, Jim sees the blast of the nuclear bomb, which initially he believes is Mrs. Victor's soul leaving her body. If we do have souls, there were tens of thousands of souls being separated from their bodies at that moment, which brings us back to the pragmatist debate. The nuclear bombs were justified by the looming invasion of the United States that would have certainly killed more people than the nukes. Now, it's easy to take that position and just say, all's fair in love and war, we had to do it. And I would agree with that personally. But there is a danger of not acknowledging the other side of the decision, not recognizing the innocence destroyed by the atomic bombs. If humans are special in some way, if we have an eternal element to us, then we best think long and hard about the mass destruction of life, no matter how justifiable it may be. And that's what I think the contrasting events are about. Mrs. Victor is an individual who we've come to care about through Jim's story, and she's killed by the Japanese. The thousands killed during the bombing are nameless and faceless, yet they're still human beings with inherent value. Before Jim is taken home by American soldiers, Basie returns to camp with his buddies, and they kill Jim's friend because he's, quote, a Jap. In a state of delusion, Jim tries to resuscitate him, and for a short moment, we see Jim's former self. Jamie is now dead forever. He cannot be brought back. But Jim is also killed when he turns down Basie's offer to help him find his parents. The boy that finds his mom and dad is absent in identity. Because of this, his father doesn't even recognize him initially. It's his mother that finally recognizes her only child, 
and it's a great moment in the history of cinema. The score is just beautiful, and the moment he reconnects with his mother is different from many similar moments in other films. Jim has to evaluate his mother for a moment. He has to touch her face and see her hair, because his mother was part of his former life, which is now dead and buried. When he finally accepts her embrace, he's beginning a new chapter in his life. A blank page lies in front of him, and he can begin writing again with his parents by his side. Spielberg has crafted a number of brilliant endings, but this is right up there with the best of them. Empire of the Sun does not come up often when we consider the best war films ever made. In Spielberg's own filmography, Saving Private Ryan is always the first to come to mind, of course. But there is a distinct poetic element to Empire of the Sun that has a powerful impact. I thought about the movie a lot in the days that followed my viewing. Our environment constantly changes, and so do our ideals. There are times when one human ideal, one imitatable figure, seems like the fix to all of our problems. For Jim, this was Basie. But we need to be cognizant of what those ideals may be lacking. So many people idealize their parents, but carry on their parents' faults. Empire of the Sun advises a more balanced approach even when the environment seems to be begging for a single solution. If you enjoyed this video, I have a whole playlist that looks at famous war films, and if you enjoy stories as a whole, fiction or nonfiction, make sure to destroy the subscribe button on your way out. I will be posting a wide array of content over the coming year. Thank you so much for stopping by. Have a fantastic rest of your day. I'll talk to you soon.